During the Cold War, the United States worked hard to try to understand what was going on inside the Soviet Union and other communist countries. Part of getting that done involved photographic reconnaissance. The U-2 was developed to overfly those countries. But when Francis Gary Powers was shot down in 1960, high, slow flyers became much more restricted. Satellites capable of taking photos were relatively new and fairly basic. They had low resolution, and recovering the photos by parachute took time. In response to this, Lockheed was selected to build a survivable spy plane. The eventual outcome of that effort, the SR-71, first flew in December of 1964. Our guest today is Ed Yielding, who flew the faster-than-a-bullet SR-71 on more than 90 worldwide reconnaissance missions. He also set a speed record on the SR-71's final flight in military service, flying from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. in under 65 minutes. We caught up with Lieutenant Colonel Yielding at his home in Florence, Alabama. Ed Yielding, welcome to the Adrenaline Zone, and thanks for being with us today. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate your interest. Well, you know, I'm delighted that our, our mutual friend, Kevin Chilton, uh, introduced us and really appreciate you joining us today. And, you know, we like to start off with our guests, like, you know, where are you from and how did you get into what you're doing? How did you get into the Air Force? Uh, how did it all start? Well, I was raised in Florence, Alabama, up in the northwest corner of Alabama on the Tennessee River. Had nearly a, an ideal childhood, I would say. I uh, went to Auburn University and I really I wanted to fly the Blackbird. I had my eyes on it since I was 15 years old when it was announced by President Johnson in 1964. And uh, so ROTC at Auburn and ROTC was good to pay my books and tuition and promised to send me to pilot training afterwards. And so uh, that's how I, that's how I entered the Air Force through ROTC at Auburn University. You know, that's three of us have, have something in common then because Sandra wanted to be an astronaut from the time she was a little girl. I wanted to fly the F-14 from the when I was in high school on. And I can't believe you wanted to fly the SR-71 from the time you were a young teenager. That's cool. <laughs> you know, you didn't start that way. You started off as an RF-4 pilot. And so what was that mission like? And then how did you transition from that to the SR-71? To be a selected for the SR-71, you have to have had about 10 years of high-performance jet experience. And so out of pilot training, I was able, I graduated near the top of my class, and I was able to choose uh, an RF-4. I was interested in photography and, and also the, the jet. So our mission in the RF-4 was uh, high-speed, low-altitude uh, photography. So our mission was in combat to fly below enemy radar. And of course, that was before GPS, and we had to, we did have an INS, but we had to map read our way around the, the low level course, uh, 480 knots and 500 feet uh, altitude. And in places, we were allowed to go down much lower than that. Wow, we can have a whole conversation on risk. Yeah, I really enjoyed flying that RF 4, and we participated in red flag. Uh, uh, war game exercises out in Nevada, and uh, uh, and and I did after the RF four, I did fly the F four fighter for three years, and so I had a total of nine years of uh, Phantom experience before I was selected for the SR seventy one, and uh, really love flying the Phantom. It was uh, dangerous though; you had to be really careful, uh, especially all that low altitude work, and uh, in in those. Uh, Red flag war game exercises. Over that nine years, I lost uh, six friends in accidents practicing for the defense of our freedom. The SR 71's a very special airplane, right? It was way ahead of its time and its design and you know the whole thing. So, what can you tell us about, first of all, its principal designer, Kelly Johnson, uh, and sort of the unclassified cool aspects of, of its unique uh, construction and airframe? Well, the the airplane itself has been all declassified now, so nothing about it is is classified now. Huh. Uh, some of the sensor capabilities are still classified, but otherwise, the airplane is a fascinating machine. 
really love flying it. Just an amazing machine. Kelly Johnson was the principal designer with Lockheed Skunk Works. Um, he was born in 1910. I read his biography. He's one of my heroes. So I, I know a lot about him. Uh, he, uh, as a child, he wanted he wanted to design airplanes. He did not want to fly them particularly, but he wanted to design them and became one of America's premier airplane designers. And his uh, his uh, stepson showed me uh, a scrapbook that young Kelly had made when he was 12 years old. And I enjoyed flipping through that scrapbook on airplanes. And, and one article that really caught my attention was a, an article about how, you see, that would have been in 1923. Um, how the French had just taken the world speed record from the United States. So he had that article cut out, and at the top of the page, he had four exclamation points and said, notice, and you can practically <laughs> hear young Kelly saying, that is unacceptable, and I'm going to design that, airplane didn't he? that'll take the speed record, and he sure did. <laughs> uh, but what made Kelly uh, so successful was not only was he a brilliant engineer, but he's also a brilliant manager. He didn't build the airplane by himself. And, and so engineering and management made him highly successful. He designed the P-38 World War II, uh, America's first uh, operational jet fighter, the F-80 Shooting Star, the F-104, the U-2 spy plane, which was shot down over Russia in 1960. Francis Gear Powers. And so he decided, well, I'll build an airplane that's too high and too fast to be shot down. And so it was a crowning achievement, the beautiful and at the, at the time mysterious SR-71 Blackbird. Well, it's still, I think, one of the more beautiful planes ever, quite frankly. Oh, it really is. It, it still looks futuristic, even though it was built in the early 1960s. His engineers were using slide rules still. You know, to design the airplane. Wow. Well, I, I could talk. <laughs> it's amazing. I, I, could, I can talk a long time just about the construction of the airplane and some of the features about it. Well, for one thing, it was a very high temperature, right? That's right. So friction with the air cruising in air that was minus 70, minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit near 80,000 feet, friction with the air caused the skin temperature to average 550 degrees Fahrenheit. And so there were parts of the airplane that were much hotter than that due to the, due to the friction. So uh, aluminum alloys, which most airplanes are built of, uh, would be too soft at that high temperature. So he uh, designed or made it out of uh, titanium. So they pioneered the use of titanium in construction of the airplane. Expensive and difficult. Right. It was. It really was. And so with the temperature, uh, the, the airplane grew about uh, four inches due to the high temperature. So it had to have these expansion joints and had to be able to expand. Uh, and uh, I pulled out the coefficient of, <laughs> coefficient of expansion for titanium to make sure that was <laughs> correct. And it, it, it four inches sounds pretty reasonable for that temperature. And they had to anticipate that. It wasn't something they discovered. They had to plan for that, which was a the exceptionally design. good engineering. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Wow. Uh -huh. That's that's an amazing airplane. So Ed, I, I've seen uh photographs of the cockpit. You know, every pilot wants to see what the cockpit looks like in an airplane, right? And I was I was shocked at how complicated that cockpit looked. More steam gauges than I think I've ever seen. Uh, certainly, I would think more than than the Phantom, the F four Phantom had. What, what was it like to sit in that cockpit in your pressure suit uh, with all that complexity? Because it was quite a complex uh, airplane to, to fly, right? Before we ever had our first flight in the airplane, we had almost, I'd say, a hundred hours of academics and simulator time, and and we were it was high, highly stressed to keep a constant uh, cross scan across all of those instruments because at that speed you could get in trouble in a hurry if you didn't catch certain malfunctions uh, in a timely way. So we, our mission were constantly scanning those those uh, gauges. Now the airplane was updated through the years with uh, digital computers. When I first got in the airplane in 1983, they were just transitioning from analog computers to digital computers. They updated the computers and the uh, software, uh, the uh, 
sensors, quite a few things about the airplane were updated through the years, but there was never really a need to update the pilot displays. And that was just, just fine with me. Those, those, uh, uh, 60s gauges work just fine. So, you know, it's interesting because, we you know, we train and fly in the shuttle. We wear pressure suits as well, right? And we're going really fast as well. But we had a crew of four, right? And, and first, I have to tell you that pilot and the commander hated wearing the gloves, even though there's not as many gauges and stuff in the, in the shuttle. But between, you know, it took us four brains to kind of keep up with the vehicle in order to be able to take over uh, if we had to fly manually, which of course is what you were doing. So did you start with a two seater to do this or did you have to do all that with one single brain right from the get go? Cause that's, that's a lot of workload to your point you just made. By the time we had our first flight, we're nearly an expert in the airplane just due to all that simulator training, but we did have a trainer. They, they built two trainers and one of the trainers was crashed in the seventies. So we had one trainer and the back cockpit was built up a little higher so the instructor at the back could see forward. So our first five flights in the trainer were with an instructor. Uh, I had a I had excellent instructors. Uh, BC Thomas was was one of my main instructors and he wound up with more flying time in the Blackbird than any other pilot in history at 1217.3 hours. Mm. Uh, and, wow. Uh, he, he 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 uh he re- really worked us over in, in the simulator and it never occurred to me during those difficult simulator missions that that he would someday be one of my best friends <laughs> so uh, and 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 uh bernie smith also was was one of my lead in, in, instructors so they'd throw the kitchen sink at you in the simulator <laughs> oh they did yeah and it really paid off uh, later on because because malfunctions were pretty common in the airplane Although we had a, a really good, really good record for being able to get uh, accomplish our mission, but it wasn't unusual for the for something serious enough to happen that we would have to land away at a friendly base. So, what kind, I mean, what was the most common set of malfunctions, or was it just kind of all over the place? Because, I mean, having to land from a malfunction is sort of a critical thing. Quite a number of malfunctions could could happen i suppose engine related malfunctions would be what would most of the time cause land away uh missions land away at a friendly friendly base so so you had uh five flights in the trainer Ed, before you could fly in the airplane that that had a mission specialist in the back seat how many flights did you have to have total before you could actually do an operational flight uh, an operational reconnaissance flight we had to have a, a hundred hours of flying in the airplane, and uh, th- those training missions were around the Western United States. And so, I probably average average uh, probably four hours flights. So, four under a hundred hours, I guess we had about twenty five, probably about twenty five missions. Mm-hmm. The the pressure suit was really pretty comfortable to fly in. It was, I guess it was very similar. Matter of fact, the first shuttle missions borrowed our pressure suit, so you, you know how it felt. But we had uh, air conditioning tubes through the through the pressure suit, and it was pretty comfortable. And uh, the switches in the airplane were made large enough that we could operate the switches with our pressure, uh, yeah. pressure suit gloves, and re- really that really wasn't a, a problem. And our missions were short enough, short enough that you know we weren't in that suit all of that long uh our longest routine missions were five and a half hours some we had some missions as as short as two hours over in okinawa up to uh the the boundaries of north korea a lot of those were only two hours so and uh, yeah we were we were in those suits for seven eight nine could be (laughs) yeah yeah we, we we had a few, few <laughs> That's fun. we had a few yeah we had a few missions that were eleven hours, uh, and the longest uh, one I had I had a couple that were eight hours. Wow, amazing! So you know, talking about I mean, this plane is amazing, but it was and still is, quite frankly, at the forefront of technology. So there's all kind of risks with flying a plane like that. You know, you're going really fast. 
the engines are offset, you've got low pressure at high altitude, you've got temperature issues, you're in a pressure suit. I'm assuming you had a harness and a parachute and some kind of ejection system. Could you get out of the plane if you had a problem way up there? What what does your what does that kind of a scenario look like? We did have an ejection seat, uh, similar to most any fighter, and we had had a parachute. So if you ejected at eighty thousand feet, you would fall with the seat till you, you got to, you got to fifteen thousand feet, and then the big parachute would 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 automatically open. Uh, but they had a it had oxygen in the in the uh, survival kit. Mm-hmm. And it had a small drug chute so you could sit, sit upright and enjoy the view on the way down. <laughs> I can't imagine, though, ejecting at Mach 3, uh, even though the, I don't know what the indicated airspeed is at 80,000 feet in Mach 3. It's probably not that high, but still, you're going, your body's not going to survive a supersonic ejection up there, is it? Yeah, you could. Yeah. The air, air was thin enough. Yeah, there's enough. no air. Yeah. yeah. So we were cruising at near 80,000 feet, 85,000 feet was our max altitude. And we always try to operate with the best um, altitude for the weight of the airplane for fuel economy. Um, <clears throat> so normally we didn't get all the way to 80, 85,000 feet, but uh, somewhere in the 80,000 range. And so at that altitude, we're above 97% of the air molecules. And so you had a really nice view of the earth. Uh, you can see the curvature of the earth and more noticeable than the curvature was how dark it was overhead. So it wasn't as black as what uh, Sandy saw, uh, Sandra saw, but uh, it was very, very dark, uh, very, very, very dark blue, almost black. So that was even more noticeable than the curvature of, of the earth. I think it's really cool that you can say the sentence, yeah, we were cruising around at 85, we were cruising at 85,000 feet. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, <laughs> just a matter of routine. Yeah. So Ed, you flew a lot of operational missions during your career as a Blackbird pilot. Uh, you know, how, you, we already talked about how long they were, but you know, how often did you have to refuel? You, know, you didn't stay at high altitude and high speed the whole time. Uh, but what, what kinds of missions were you, were you out there flying operationally? We were flying... Um, Primarily border reconnaissance around uh, North Korea, uh, around the Soviet Union, um, along the northern borders of the Soviet Union, around the Arctic Circle area, uh, the eastern Eastern Bloc countries of the Europe. We had some missions uh, in the Middle East um, and a few down in uh, Central America. Uh, Nicaragua, when Ortega was causing problems back in 1984. Um, so th- those were uh, our primary, primary missions. And uh, just sort of as a follow on it, you know, you hear or read stories about, you know, the SR-71 got shot at a lot, uh, but never hit. Uh, do you have any reflections on that? Uh, is that all, um, you know, folklore or, or were you ever really engaged uh, by threat missile systems or fighters? As far as I know, I was never, never fired at, as far as I know. Uh, sometimes we did see Soviet fighters uh, try to intercept us, but we were very difficult to intercept because of our speed and altitude. Uh, only once, you could see the, you could see the fighter contrails that way down below. And only once did one get close enough that I could actually see metal, and I'm guessing it was probably seven miles away. I was told later it was a MiG-31. Yeah, I was going to say it must have been a Fox batter or something like that. Yeah. They were fired at some during during Vietnam. You know, the airplane was used during Vietnam. Um, I'm I'm skeptical about thousands of missiles that are being fired, at, which which is a number I've heard sometimes. But I I don't know that I don't know that for for sure. Uh, none none of our airplanes were fired upon with a missile that we know of during my era, which was 1983 to 1990. Shortly before I started in 1983, there was one missile fired at an SR-71 near uh, North Korea. I think that was in 1982, <clears throat> but it didn't come close. It'd have to be a pretty lucky shot to hit it. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, no way. Yeah. Hmm. 
So when you start, started flying this airplane in 1983, uh, I don't think GPS existed then. If if it did, it was rudimentary. And, uh, you know, you're going at Mach 3, you're going really fast over the ground. Uh, how did you navigate? Uh, you know, countryside's going by pretty fast. Um, what kind of systems did you use to to know where you were? Yeah, we did not, of course, did not have GPS. And, and, and we started when the airplane was uh, retired in 1990, there were plans to uh, to get GPS capability for the airplane, but it was canceled before uh, before we got that. But the, the airplane used uh, inertia navigation system. We called it, it was called a ANS, Astro Navigation System. So for navigation, the planners planned the exact route of the flight, and it was the route of the flight was put on the magnetic tape and that magnetic tape was loaded into the airplane. So the airplane knew what the route was. Uh, <clears throat> and with our INS system, inertia navigation system, you know, the INS system will drift with time. So INS systems have to be updated by radar or radio signals from the ground. We couldn't depend on the Russians to give us good radio signals. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't just so, dial up their TACAD yeah. station. Okay. Yeah, so, so uh, <clears throat> they we had a a star system, uh, star tracker. There was a little telescope mounted behind the navigator, and that a little telescope would slew around and find find stars. And so for that for that to work, the backseater had to dial in what day of the year what day of the year you're flying and they would plug in a very accurate clock into the airplane. So it knew the airplane knew exactly where the earth was in its rotation as well as its revolution. So it knew where to look for the stars and it would look in the direction of a star and then do a search until it found the star, measure that angle and keep our position uh, updated. I always thought that was really cool from early 1960s navigation that's amazing it really resonates with me because what you know in, in the early days me flying the f-14 we didn't have gps either and we would maintain our combat air patrol station off of iran using an iranian navigation aid uh they were they conveniently kept their tack in on for us so that we could uh <laughs> you know keep stationed there and the other thing mm -hmm. though celestially i would you know i would always turn my cockpit lights way way down at night and i would you know, construct my turns based on looking at the stars. So not quite as accurate as your system, but it was pretty cool to be able to to do that. So, you know, back in the day, right? That's um, right. Yeah. Pretty cool. Wow. So you were the last person ever to fly this magical aircraft called the SR-71. Can you tell our listeners about that final flight? Okay. Um, <clears throat> but let me, let me preface that with, uh, it turned out that I was not the last uh, at the time, they thought that I was going to be the last supersonic. My flight would be the last supersonic flight, and then there were going to be subsonic flights to museums after that. And then in 1980, uh, I mean, 1995, 96, uh, Senator Byrd thought we, we might be having a war with uh, North Korea, so they reactivated three blackbirds and there was there were crews that were selected to fly those three airplanes um training uh, training missions around 1996 97 and then <clears throat> then after uh, the air force canceled it again nasa was given permission to fly uh training flights or, or research flights in the blackbird and I believe that the last uh, NASA mission in the Blackbird was uh, in 1999. Mm -hmm. So were you sitting by the phone, Ed, waiting for somebody to call you and, and uh, say, hey, you know, we need you back? <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm still waiting for that. I keep thinking. <laughs> <laughs> you could probably still fly it, right? Some of these, some of these really, some of these really modern airplanes, I would, I would love to fly them. <laughs> I was uh, very fortunate to be, chosen to fly uh, an airplane to the Smithsonian uh, Museum. Since the airplane was being retired in 1990, museums all over the country wanted one, including the Smithsonian. And so the decision was made to send uh, Blackbird 
tail number 972, which was our test airplane at, at Palmdale. I had been in the airplane by about six years by this time. And the last two years, I was as a test pilot down at, at Palmdale flying the, the uh, Blackbird. So JT Vita was the test RSO that was assigned to fly that with me. And I, I had I had flown a, a lot of test missions with JT and I was, anyway, we we felt it both extremely fortunate to, to fly that flight to the Smithsonian. And, and JT, by the way, uh, he had more time in the Blackbird than any other crew member in history, pilot or navigator. He, he wound up with 1,392 uh, hours in the airplane. And I'll just mention after our after our speed record flight, he got cancer and passed away two two years after mm. our flight. And I just want to say, no, oh, that's what unfortunate. A, what a pleasure it was to fly with JT. Just a wonderful friend and outstanding RSO reconstant systems officer. So the two of us uh, felt so fortunate to be selected because we knew that any of the crews had the skill to fly that flight. We were just really, and so we wanted to um, do our very best to to represent all the Blackbird community in that speed record flight across the country to the Smithsonian. And the reason it was a speed record flight is the Smithsonian wrote a letter to the Secretary of the Air Force, Donald Rice, and said, "When you pilot, when your pilot brings the airplane to the Smithsonian, please have them have them set an official." Coast to coast airplane speed record, and that would call the public's attention to what a great airplane it has been for our country for 25 years. So that was the purpose of the speed record, call the public's attention to it. <clears throat> so our plan was to take off from Palmdale. We would fly 200 miles out over the Pacific and air refuel, get a full load of fuel, light the afterburners, and get a 200 mile running start. The NAA, the National Aeronautic Association, is the, the agency that monitors and verifies official speed records. So they had representatives on each coast, and they also wanted uh, three city-to-city -city records along the way. And you would think a city-to-city -city record would be for takeoff to landing, but it, it, that's not how they do the city-to-city -city records. You pass by a city at speed, Get the time, and then as you pass the destination at speed, they get the time. So that's how, so that's how we were able to do three city to city records as we did the coast to coast record. So fuel was going to be really tight to, really tight to fly all the way across the country, at, at top speed. Ordinarily, we weren't allowed to fly faster than three point two, but my commander gave us permission to fly on Mach three point three uh, for our crews. We didn't have the fuel across. West Coast at Mach 3.3 and the East Coast at 3.3, turn around and land at Dulles. So we had to plan it so that we were accelerating accelerating past the West Coast uh, through Mach 2.5. And then a few minutes later, we would be at our top speed, Mach 3.3. So we took off for Palmdale at 4.30 in the morning Pacific time, which is 4.30 in the morning Washington time. We uh, Joined with those tankers out over the Pacific. It was pitch dark, no no moon, no horizon, but we had refueled at night many times. We uh, got our fuel and lit the burners, accelerated toward the West Coast, crossed it, Mach 2.5 is planned, climbing and accelerating. Uh, but we're flying toward the sun, so the sun's coming up really rapidly. So uh, we could we could see the see the sunrise as we're crossing the west coast then a few minutes later uh, we we could see uh, the sun is up and we could see the, the entire city of las vegas down there and uh, lake mead <clears throat> a few minutes later see the grand canyon and uh, uh it was a special flight so i was having some special thoughts and remembering uh my, one of my favorite hymns america the beautiful we're cruising right over uh, Heart of America at Mach 3.3. Uh, we passed by those uh, majestic mountains of southwest uh, Colorado, as is sung about in that 
song, America the Beautiful, we passed about 60 miles south of Pikes Peak. For the top of Pikes Peak is where Catherine Bates was inspired to write that wonderful song, America the Beautiful. A few minutes later, we're going right over that fruited plain that she sang about in mm. her song. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of miles of prime American farmland. I thought about all those thousands of uh, farmers down there starting their day, getting ready to raise food that feeds most of our country and even enough to export overseas. I thought about our brave pioneers that I read about as a boy. Uh, and explorers taking months to cross country that JT and I were covering in just a matter of minutes. Thought about what a great, great country we have made great by the hard work and sacrifices and courage and prayers of our forefathers. Uh, the eastern part of the country was uh, undercast, so we didn't see many features in the eastern part of the country. But JT and I just made sure we enjoyed those last few minutes of a, a view of God's earth from 80,000 80, feet. We wound up at 83,000 feet on that flight. Uh, and and uh, just thinking how very, very fortunate we were to serve alongside hundreds of other highly dedicated men and women who designed and maintained, supported, and flew the Blackbird through 25 years of service. And and just made sure we enjoyed our last few minutes of flying that marvelous, marvelous airplane. What a great story. That's a lovely story. I do have a practical question I've, I've been wanting to yes. ask, though, because you're, we're, not, we're not supposed to have sonic booms over land, but yet you were flying supersonic over land. So did you get special dispensation or what happened with the sonic boom you were creating the whole way across the country as you were flying so fast? All those farmers yeah. you were talking about. <laughs> like, not happy. What was that? What was that? <laughs> yeah. How'd yeah. you get, I mean, did you, how, uh, what well, happened with that? Did you get stories from people, surprise people? Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was worried about adverse publicity. Uh, and I was afraid that, um, they would, they would, I was afraid that there would be people, uh, making false claims against the government as a chance to get cracked windows and cracked walls repaired. <clears throat> but uh, but public affairs at, at the Pentagon told me uh, later that there were, were no claims. And, and as soon as people found out that it was the, the, the Blackbird on its historic mission that they heard, uh, they were just uh, happy to have heard something historic. But, you know, the Blackbird flew regularly during our training missions, supersonic over the Western United States. And so we were allowed to be, we were allowed to be supersonic as long as we were above 30,000 feet. So when we were, when we were transitioning from subsonic to supersonic, we would have to be above 30,000 feet as we, as we went supersonic. We did try to, on those training missions, we would avoid major cities. Once we got to altitude, though, the the, uh, the sonic booms were were noticeable, but you know, not not dramatic, not not nearly enough to break anything. I guess when you're that high, uh, it doesn't matter as much as if you're down low doing it. So, Ed, I see that beautiful model over your shoulder on your mantelpiece of the SR. Uh, I know you must miss the flying, you must miss the airplane, uh, but uh, tell us, you know, you're doing something else right now, doing some pretty cool volunteer work. Uh, tell us about that. I always liked math a lot, and during COVID, you know, when we're all locked in, I thought, well, for entertainment, I decided to review my, do a really good review of my calculus, through primarily through the great courses, um, those, those great courses, videos. And uh, Dr. Uh, Bruce, Dr. Bruce Edwards just has a marvelous series on calculus and pre-calculus. And I, so I watched carefully those and I, had, I bought me a, an updated uh, handheld computer, a graphing computer. So just for fun, I watched all of those and worked out the, some of the problems with my calculator. And I thought after all of that study, I, just for entertainment, I thought, well, I ought, to, I ought to try to put it to use. Uh, ask our local community college if if they had any need for somebody like me, um, <clears throat> and so they they invited me to uh, tutor. I told them I would. I told them I'd do it for free. 
I, t- I would tutor for free. And so they let me tutor for free for a couple of weeks. And then they said, well, uh, we're paying our other tutors and we insist on paying you too. So I said, well, okay. <laughs> but uh, so that was really nice. And I'm really in, been enjoying uh, tutoring, tutoring calculus at the community college. So I just wanted Sandra to hear that because now she knows that not all fighter pilots are dumb. Uh, I never said that. <laughs> Don't put words in my yeah. mouth. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dude. Well, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, you know, we're, we're uh, pretty much out of time, but I just wanted to say, I know you probably don't like uh, being described as, as a hero uh, because you, to you, I'm sure you were just doing your job, right? But there's something to me heroic about flying that magnificent airplane for so many years, doing it in hazardous conditions, doing it flawlessly. And then being, you know, uh, being able to set those records uh, on your last flight. So, uh, you know, hats off to you, Ed. Absolutely. Uh, really proud to know you and to have the opportunity to talk to you about this magnificent airplane. Thanks for sharing your time with us. Amazing stories. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. And, and I, I just want to say I, I, I read your, both of your biographies and I just truly admire both of you so much. And I appreciate your service for our country, both of you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That was former SR-71 Blackbird pilot Ed Yielding. I'm Sandra Magnus. And I'm Sandy Winnefeld. Check us out on social media, including a short video of our interview with Ed on TikTok. Our handle is very simple, at The Adrenaline Zone. <laughs>